All right, folks, before we jump into today's very informative uh, upload with some very terrifying experiences, all connected to, once again, what we talked about yesterday's in yesterday's upload, uh, the one world government, which would be Illuminati, the 1%, um, Nephilim, Stargates, etc., portals, just a lot of crazy stuff. I want to share with you, a subscriber sent me another birthday gift. Uh, first one that I received this year was a death whistle from Pups. But Leah, who is on our live stream, sent me a really cool big or Dogman Experience shirt. It's all fun and games until the Dogman stands up. And if you've ever been to our live stream, you know we have a lot of fun. Uh, I created kind of a running joke about the world's deadliest cryptid would be the lot lizard. And if you don't know what a lot lizard is, uh, look it up. <laughs> but I dropped my load in a lot lizard. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Thank you, Leah, for the amazing shirts. And uh, wow, you know, it, it's awesome. You guys really are awesome. You make this channel special. So thank you. Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today, I have another just mind blowing, informative upload to share with you. I've got some terrifying encounters, but I also have some more information that I've been researching uh, in regards to Nephilim, the government. Uh, when I say government, I mean the One World Government Illuminati, uh, super soldier programs. I also have some just absolutely terrifying dogman encounters and more. Before we get into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click the like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? Okay, so I want to start off with some of the very interesting and terrifying information that I've been compiling and share that with you guys. Uh, then we'll jump into some encounters and some more information. Uh, yesterday's upload, we talked a lot about Stargates, Anunnaki, um, Giants, and the One World Government, meaning the Illuminati. <clears throat> there is 100% proof. It is not just a conspiracy theory that the governments that are uh, in the public eye are just puppets for this 13 family bloodline, the Illuminati. But I want to start off right here with this. For several decades, researchers of the paranormal phenomena 
have devoted themselves to special, specialized fields of fringe scientific investigations. Some of these various fields of borderline research which have surfaced in order to document or attempt to explain a wide divergence of phenomena have included aerial or UFO phenomena, psychic investigation, cattle and animal mutilations, vampirism, men in black, conspiracies and assassinations, secret societies, underground anomalies, quantum mechanics, legends and mythology, ancient civilizations, the Mothman and other cryptozoological encounters, energy grids and other geomagnetic anomalies, biogenetics and cloning, cyber, or cybernetics and artificial intelligence, abduction, missing time, missing persons, and mind control. Obviously, we are um, cybernetics and artificial intelligence is not even a conspiracy like it was in the 70s and 80s. This is actually happening right now. Um, when Terminator was first released, people were like, you know, that, that'd be a crazy day. And we are on the cusp of that happening right now. Uh, so there are many others, no doubt, that have not been mentioned. <clears throat> in the 1950s, experts in some of these areas of investigation began hearing the first faint hints of something going on in the American Southwest near the Four Corner region of the United States. First, these hints were rumors, were brief, vague, and confusing, yet they sparked enough interest to provoke further investigations as the years passed. At first, these fringe scientists, who concerned themselves with the mysteries and anomalies of this region, began raising more questions than answers as they continued to probe into the enigma, which seemed to eventually focus itself in and around a small desert town lost amidst the mesas of the northwestern New Mexico. In the late 70s and early 80s, the mystery, a subsequential interest, deepened as reports began to slowly arise from an area suggesting that something significant and horrifying is taking place there near a small town of Dulce. New Mexico. The many different phenomena those previously mentioned seemed to seemed for some strange reason to converge and coagulate into one vast enigma scenario uh, of high strangeness in and around this seemingly insignificant small New Mexico town. So yesterday, when I was talking about Skinwalker Ranch. The paranormal, the UFO, the ghosts, the cryptids, and all of this kind of just swirling in and around this one place in Utah called Skinwalker Ranch. And I said, I no doubt truly believe that there is a deep underground military base there. Um, <clears throat> right now, I believe it even more because... Look at all of the security that is there. If you look at that entrance, you there is multiple concrete deterrents that you'd have to drive your vehicle in and around. Armed guards, and yet the paranormal. Uh, so it was going on in Dulce in the 70s and 80s, and people were realizing it back then even researchers commenced to analyze and categorize their respective phenomena looking for patterns and concentrations and came to a realization that several of these phenomena apparently converged in this american southwest the charts showed the largest concentration of ufo sightings northwestern new mexico 
the epicenter of cattle mutilation phenomena, northwestern Mexico. Other experts in their fields began to find similar patterns merging and linking uh, with other phenomena and at underlying levels. Researchers into conspiracy, secret society, underground anomalies, legends, and mythology, ancient civilizations, uh, and such, and other specialized vanguard fields, began looking again at this small town in New Mexico. These unusual convergence of phenomena in the singular locale sparked even more interest and more investigation. From that point on, it was as if some ancient seal had been broken, as if an ancient cloud of darkness had begun imploding in upon itself, broken apart by a piercing light of human perception and relentless probing and scrutiny of brave, daring souls. So they, they realize that there is just this darkness in Dulce, um, like Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, if you, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the TV shows or anything. Um, I've watched some documentaries and such, but it always seems so dark there, you know, and just like this darkness that I talk about a lot in the Appalachias, um, the five, the East Coast's Five state hotspot, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. They all have this darkness, this shroud of darkness. Beautiful states, beautiful people. Some of the kindest people are from those five states that I've ever met. Um, but just this really dark, deep Like in like what I'm reading now, a convergence of UFO, crypto, and other cryptozoology, not crypto. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna start now. I'm gonna bounce over here really quick. We just I just wanted to point out that there was a similarity to Dulce and Skinwalker Ranch. Um let's talk a little bit about the Nephilim or Giants. I found this interesting. We all have probably heard about Marco Polo's uh meeting with the dog-headed race of people. Now, he had supposedly stumbled across giants as well. But back in 1936, two French archaeologists, Le Bouff and Grelou, led an expedition to Chad in North Central Africa as they crossed the plains, they saw some areas covered with small mounds. They also found large numbers of these mounds around Fort Lemmy and Gull Fay. Deciding to investigate, they dug up several egg-shaped funeral jars that contained the remnants of a gigantic race. Along with pieces of their jewelry and their works of art, these giants, according to the natives, were called Seos. Scholars who traced their history say they came from Kiber, located in north of Mecca, to Bilma, which is situated around 300 miles north of Lake Chad, a people with a well-developed religion and culture. They grew in numbers and founded communities at Fort Lamay. Um, they lived in peace in their new land until the close, the close of the 9th century when the Muslims made war against them, intending to force their acceptance of the Islamic faith. 
the Seos giants who converted to a faith lived to become servants of the Arabs. But those who steadfastly refused to convert were eventually wiped out. By the end of the 16th century, not many Seos remained. Um, a Moroccan find. In Morocco reports, Peter Colosimo, a French captain, discovered a complete arsenal of hunting weapons, including 500 double-edged axe weighing 17 and a half pounds, 20 times as heavy as what would be convenient for modern man. Apart from that question of weight, to handle an axe, one would need to have hands the size appropriate to a giant with a stature of at least 13 feet. Sedan's giants. Now, this is interesting because when I when I started when I started to read about this, I immediately thought about Steph. Steph, private military contractor, um, was in the Sedan and protecting a rare earth uh, mineral mine. <clears throat> and lo and behold, a very large amount of dog-like cryptids attacked him and his uh, other private contractors and led into a long battle uh, with these creatures. So Sedan's giants, a tribe of giants, survives in Sedan, but apparently little has been written about them. In his Inside Africa, John Gunther describes them as Nilotic peoples who have spread their virile blood afar field as witness the Maasai in Kenya and the giant Watsu Watsi, uh, who are cousins to a Hemetic Sudanese. An example of the gigantic but very slender stature may be seen in Minute Boy, Minute Bull, a seven foot seven inch pro basketball player who hails from the region. Slim as he still looks, Bull has put on quite a bit of weight since his rookie year in the NBA. One sports writer jokingly wrote, that he has now added enough poundage to require at least two pinstripes on his pajamas. Bull and his tall Sudanese kin may have the height of giants, but with such extremely slender builds, they could hardly be reckoned among our other mighty men, the Wat Wat Watsui giants. Practically everyone has seen a film or at least heard about these very tall Watsui who are famous for their dancing. Uh, then this is Zanzibar's giants. In recounting of his travels, Marco Polo tells of running into a gigantic people in Zanzibar. Concerning them, he wrote, Zanzibar is situated off the coast of Tanganyika, nearly 53 miles long and 24 miles wide. It is the largest coral island on Africa coast. Numerous bays, reefs, and inlets are found along the western coast, while the eastern side is much more regular. Zanzibar is a very large, important island. It has 2,000 miles of coastline 
all people are idolaters. They have a king and a language of their own and pay tribute to no one. The men are large and fat, although they are not tall in proportion to their bulk. They are strong-limbed and hefty as giants. They are so strong that they can carry as many as four ordinary men. This is not altogether surprising because while they can carry as many as four men, they eat enough for five. <laughs> they are quite black and go about completely naked, but for a loincloth, their hair is curly. Um, their hair is so curly that they can only comb it when it was wet. They have wide mouths and turned up noses. The natives live on dates, rice, meat, and milk. They have grape wine, but they also make excellent wine from rice, sugar, and spices. There is a great deal of trade on the island, and ships arrive laden with every kind of cargo to be sold. The merchants take away their other goods, in particular ivory, from elephant tusks because of the whales. Because of the whales, there is a lot of amber ambergris. One of the men on the island are the men are extremely good fighters, courageous in battle. They are not afraid of death because there are no horses. They use camels and elephants in war. They build little turrets on the elephant's back, which they cover carefully with the skin of wild animals. Between 16 and 20 men get into these turrets from which they fight with lances, swords, and pikes. Very bloody battles are fought on elephants. The only army are leather shields. The only arms are leather shields, lances, and swords, but these men can be cruelly killed when elephants have to charge. They are given as much wine and other drink as they want, which makes them more aggressive and therefore more courageous in battle. Apart from the men, the animals, and produce in Zanzibar, there is nothing more to discuss. So we shall move on to the great province of uh, Abyssinia, meaning he moves on. So Columbus, not only does he stumble across dog-headed men at one point in his travels, but these kind of odd-shaped giants, so strong that they can carry five men, like, that's, that's very strong. Like, men back then probably only weighed a buck 40, if that, if that. So four or five of that is... <laughs> 570 pounds, 60 pounds, running around, no issues. Uh, quick disclaimer on this information that I'm going to share with you right now. All information contained here is derived from public sources, widely accepted scientific principles, and or authors' firsthand experience. The author has no written or verbal agreement with any governmental agency forbidding disclosure of the information contained here. In disclosing this information, the author is exercising his right of free speech as a private citizen of the United States of America. So, Bill Hamilton did OT3 in Scientology in 1970. He had been expelled a few years ago. Bill Robertson took him to a very first Sector 9 issue. So his viewpoint is more from a planetary and intergalactic scenario. Hamilton summarizes everything that he has found out. The Dulce, New Mexico underground base has UFOs seen in the area every night. Cattle have been mutilated cut with like a laser knife information comes from people working at the base who were kidnapped or abducted and taken there and then released as people who helped to construct it people who are working with the intelligence community there the facility is 
a biogenetics lab and is connected to Los Alamos by underground. The first site of the atom bomb experiments, it's always been a high security research area for the government. He states, there is an underground connection of subway or tube shuttle to Los Alamos. Los Alamos. Um, the research there is about genetics and research into other intelligent species and comparison between human and alien biology. Hamilton says that their research indicates centuries ago that the aliens had entered into a contract with a secret group, the Illuminati. The Sector 9 Scientology book names one of the chief implanters, someone that works in secret to control you mentally, was Adam Westbutt, the founder of the Illuminati in Germany. <clears throat> The United States government entered into a contract with these aliens in the 40s and 50s or possibly even earlier to exchange high technology research with to give animals and humans to the aliens. At the end of the 40s, the alien operation shifted from South America to the United States West because of its agreement that was made with the government. The aliens wanted these underground bases and because of the magnetic and plasma effects of some of the minerals on these on the rocks in the area were vital for them. So something about these rocks being vital, probably highly electromagnetic. Um, they have to have something that produces highly electromagnetic energy field for their saucers. So they need raw materials for that to keep things going. Hamilton says these people who worked there said that the aliens themselves regard themselves as an old people who originally came from Earth. They were human reptilian hybrids. They told the US government this and are representatives of an alien nation and are returning to Earth to use it as a staging operation area, but didn't reveal for exactly what. Other aliens do not agree about this. They built an alien base in Dulce, uh, Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, others in the United States. Others in the rest of the world, maybe Antarctica, Russia, Pyrenees, uh, Upper Norway, etc. There have been some very strange underground projects being done, costing billions in 1947, the residents of Dulce saw many, many troops going in and out of the area, many, many trucks and construction equipment, and that the signs on the trucks were from a non-existent lumber company in Colorado. The bases were constructed by the Rand Corporation with a tunnel boring machine that melts the rock and then makes a smooth wall out of out of it for high-speed shuttles to be put in. Hamilton says that there are over a hundred of these secret underground places that have been constructed, including one on the back of the moon, others possibly on Mars. So the Illuminati mentioned, you know, there's mention of the Illuminati. Well, if these Illuminati are possibly reptilians, um, some may be reptilians, I don't believe all, but in some information that I read, uh, it says possibly some of the Illuminati are reptilian-like humanoids. Uh, that definitely puts mankind at a disadvantage. And to be quite frank, I truly believe that we are at the cusp of Armageddon. You know, this, these things are ramping up for a reason, you know, and it's things that our people could have done different.
30s, 40s, 50s, did we really need that much technology? Did we really? I mean, we are, the United States is a country no older than 300 years old. And yet we are the strongest nation, one of the strongest nations on earth. It's a little strange, a little strange. Because what, why are our, our, our government was willing to just give its people up for experimentation? Yep. Yep. Okay, so let's jump into some encounters. <clears throat> this encounter was sent to me uh, back in March. And uh, the person who sent this to me um, literally was blown away by hearing this experience. I was as well and reached out to the person that had the experience and hopefully I can get them on the show because this is one heck of a crazy experience. All right, let's get into it. So my buddy literally lived across the street from the mills in Ohio, Youngstown. We would regularly go down there just to investigate this massive area, all but shut down and dilapidated. Well, we had certain old buildings that we would frequent, and one we made into our home base. We spent weeks making walls and strengthening spots so no one could get in, and especially the wild dogs that also frequented the area and were especially vicious. They traveled in packs of six or more. The building we went to all of the time had no stairs, so we had to jump up to get in. It made it safer for us. Also, it was right by an active railroad. The other working steel mill nearby used it to get supplies in and out. Fast forward to the summer, and we were all there one night, we always had our guns, as this was Youngstown, Ohio, in the mid-90s, Murdertown, USA at the time. Plenty of bloods and crypts. We had chosen an old factory building that was huge, and we would have a massive fire right on the floor of the first. We erected a wall of these metal U-shaped things to give us some privacy and safety. If anyone saw us from the railroad, they would call the police and security, and we would be in some serious trouble. Well, we're hanging out when we heard the pack of dogs coming and we thought it sounded like they were being chased or chasing something. We went out to sea and they ran near us over a huge mound of coke that steel mills use for the steel making process. They ran over and we heard a fight ensuing, vicious attacks going on, all dogs involved. After six to seven seconds, we heard a louder dog above them all, and the beginning of the screams of the wild dogs started. Then, to our shock, at different times, these wild dogs were literally being thrown over the mound in different directions. Finally, for the wild dogs, finally, all the wild dogs ran away in the direction they had come, but as fast as they could possibly run. Some were limping with obvious injuries. We were shocked. This one of my friends screams, what is that? Look, at that moment, a kid, you, I kid you not, a giant wolf-like animal, the size of which seemed quite honestly fake, crawls on all fours to the top of that mound and is looking directly into the area the other wild dogs had run. It lifts its leg and subsequently and substantially releases a urine flow that honestly seemed like it was released out of a garden hose. That right there may sound amusing, but it scared the living hell out of us because it had no idea of just how, because we had no idea just how large this thing was. My buddy stumbled backward into our makeshift wall and it then turned its attention to, to us. I cannot relay to you the amount of fear that we immediately felt. I feel that even now sharing this, the hairs on my arm are standing up. They had yellowish amber colored eyes that literally glowed like there was a power source behind them. 
Looking back on it, we agreed it was from the light of the huge bonfire that we had made in our home base. It growled next, and it was deep, and we all felt it. I said aloud that I just felt that in my chest. My two buddies said they were all of a sudden lightheaded and feeling sick. I didn't get that at the moment, but we were all horrified. It then did something so shocking, so alien to the status quo that we immediately felt in danger and ran inside of the building and up two sets of broken and missing falling apart concrete steps. To the third level, we were all very lucky that no one had fell to at least broken a bone of some type, maybe worse. It stood up on two legs. Its back legs, they looked like the huge set of dog legs, but large leg muscles were reminiscent of the bodybuilder, but thicker. And just the look of its massive body was unbelievably impressive and intimidating. One of my friends was crying. He was terrified. When we got to the third floor, we had to smack and shake him to shut up, as well as cover his mouth until... He almost passed out from a lack of air. We hoped that it had left, but it did not. After what seemed like an hour, but was only one or two minutes, we heard it climbing up on the outside and start to enter the building. We first saw the shadow of it, which was ten times, large, ten times as large as the beast. We all froze. No one dared make a sound. We should have dropped down out of sight, but we were so terrified. We just stood there staring. It came into the light, and we saw everything on this creature. It was, at the very least, the size of a grizzly bear. Again, the size was so large, it was hard to believe that we were not dreaming, that it was real. It was, and it was happening 20 feet in front of us. It was growling, sniffing the air, and just automatically looking straight up at us, like it knew right where we were. The whole time, its eyes glowing. The thing that stood out to us was it started to drool, but not a little, like it was pouring out of its mouth, pouring from the idea that it was going to eat and kill us. It could have easily. It looked away from us and saw the stairs. We froze again and got a newfound feeling of horror. It was heading to the stairs to come up to where we were. We started freaking out, looking around and only had one escape an outside fire case fire staircase going up to the roof the part to go down had rusted and fell off long ago it hopped easily over three steps missing and was instantly up on the second floor i was walking to the next set of stairs and at that moment we heard the most beautiful sound ever a train coming right at the building, slowly as well. They had, they had to have seen the fire because when they were passing the building, they let loose the treason horn, and it freaked out that wolf creature. It looked toward the opening of the building, and in two seconds was out of the building and gone. We all started screaming for help, which no one heard, but also... We just were screaming from the stress and because we felt we were going to be maybe okay. When the train could no longer be heard, the fear set back in and we thought every single sound was this thing that came back. It did not, thank God. We then started to remember we had three pistols with us. We took them out, took, took the safeties off and started to make our way back down to the second floor. Waited 20 minutes there and then to the first floor and waited probably an hour before we ventured back outside, pointing the guns and flashlights in front of us. The whole time remembering, we didn't have LED lights in the 90s. These were cheap plastic ones that only lit so much up, but four of them helped light the way. We thought for sure every second we were making our way back to my friend's house that this thing would come after us we heard the wild dogs in the distance that started running we ran until we got to my buddy's house those of us who were though those of us 
who are still alive talk about that night every time we see or talk to each other. We will remember this until the day we die. I am still in awe that these things exist. Every time I see or hear an experience about someone's someone's own experience with one or more of these, I freeze. I am instantly brought back to that night that I feel true terror. Um, just like you are, you are practically in a downtown region. The only reason why you are isolated is because there are steel mills or old steel mills around you. And this creature comes out of nowhere. I, I believe truly that there may not be many woods in that area, but, and I've said this for years, I believe that, and many of, many of us do, that these things use uh, waterways to travel and train tracks, uh, power lines, just any kind of uh, trail or easy travel, whatever, that is hidden from humanity, they will use. So, all right, so I got two more things that I want to share with you quickly um, that are just mind blowing. So when I shared that stuff about Dulce in the 70s and 80s, when the rumors were going about, about, you know, this secret area in New Mexico that UFOs were being seen, cryptids were being seen. And just a lot of strangeness. Well, like Skinwalker Ranch. And one of the things that was mentioned was vampir vampirism or vampirism. Um, my dad was in Vietnam. Many of your parents or many of your fathers might have been. Uh, or grandfathers, depending on your age. And this is very interesting. Vampires in the Vietnam War. The difficulties of American troops during the Vietnam War often are attributed to the skillful tactics of its opponent and lack of support on the home front. But U.S. forces were hampered by another stealthful enemy in Southeast Asia, vampires. From the beginning, combat in Vietnam jungles presented new challenges for the American troops. The Army in particular was trained and equipped for conventional mechanicalized wars such as what they had faced in Europe. And Vietnam, with its jungle fighting, was a whole new game. Viet Cong were masters of guerrilla warfare, during which they would hit troops with surprise attacks and recede back into the jungle. They also effectively used small villages as bases and munition storages. In an attempt to turn the tables, the United States Marine Corps developed a civil operations and revolutionary development support or CORDS program, which assigned small units to patrol the villages. The Marines sought to recruit members of indigenous tribes in the mountains of West Vietnam to help them. But the Marines quickly discovered that the tribes were fearful of venturing into certain areas because of the presence of Ma or phantoms, one tribe in particular, the Monta, Monta Gennard, spoke of reanimated corpses that haunted the jungles, drinking blood and consuming internal organs of people unlucky enough to cross them. United States commanders were quickly to dismiss the claims as local superstition. Alas, it wasn't a superstition at all. Reports of troop encounters with ghouls in the jungle began trickling into the United States command around 1965. At first, the stories involved troops catching glimpses of ghostly figures moving throughout the jungle. Soldiers who saw these creatures described them as having fangs and black eyes. And then soldiers began to disappear from their platoons. In one incident, two American soldiers rescued one of their comrades from a creature that was apparently impervious to their bullets. U.S. commanders initially suspected vampires as Vietnam, home of 41 species of bat, 
had a history of outbreaks, one person infected in an isolated jungle village with no access to a vaccine could quickly spread that affliction throughout the entire community. Strangely, though, the undead creatures often appeared in daylight hours, a feat thought to be impossible for vampires. One platoon of American troops found the entire village of San Ho occupied by these creatures despite the daylight hour. The embattled creatures managed to flee into the surrounding jungle. With troop morale plummeting in the Vietnam, Viet Cong making, making gains, top army brass brought Top Army Brass brought several high-ranking F- FVZA agents to Saigon in the fall of 66 for consultation. The helicopter, the Army helicoptered these agents into the village of San Ho, scene of a daytime battle between U.S. troops and these ghouls. Once there, the agents noticed that the triple canopy jungle was filtering almost all of the sunlight before it reached the ground. They speculated that this filtering was enabling these vampires to operate during day. In a report to Lyndon B. Johnson, the FVZA concluded that eliminating the vampires would be virtually impossible in Vietnam's jungles. When Johnson read the conclusion, he famously said, if the jungles were, if the jungles the problem, then let's get rid of that damn jungle. Thus began the infamous herbicidal warfare program. The military chose a defoliant known as Agent Orange and sprayed 20 million gallons all over a 6 million acre of jungle. Once the canopy was denuded, Troops went into suspected villages with flamethrowers to exterminate the remaining vampires. The program was successful in clearing several large packs of these creatures from the mountainous regions of Vietnam. However, many American soldiers and their allies remained unwilling to go into these jungle villages. As a result, the Marine Corps abandoned the CORD program in 1968 and returned to the policy of almost indistinguishable from the army. The Vietnam jungles were left to the Viet Cong, the indigenous tribes, and the vampires. And tonight's final experience. My experience took place back in 2013. I was 16 years old. My granddad had a small cattle farm in northeast Arkansas. He had around 70 to 100 cattle at the time. Granddad was a very rigid man, never saw him scared or shed a tear, even at my grandmother's funeral. Our property is mainly pasture with some patches of thick woods and a creek that runs through the middle. November, my favorite time of year as the first weekend of November, was the first gun hunt for deer season. Me and my friend Jason stayed over at my granddad's every year for the weekend so we could hunt. The first morning of the season started out normal as the years had passed before. We awoke up on my grandpa's sectional at 4.30, still tired and groggy, as we had stayed up till 2 a.m. pumped for the next morning of hunting. We grabbed our guns and gear and headed out the door. It was a cold, stale morning, very quiet and calm. We took off down the driveway, walking toward the gate to the pasture where our hunting stands were. It was around one and a half mile walk. All we had to light the way was a couple of headlamps my granddad had gotten us for Christmas the year before. We make it to our hunting spot, get set up, as we have done hundreds of times before. At this time, it is around 545. We're waiting for the shooting light. The deer stand is set up along a pasture against the creek in the woods. Deer would often walk out of that creek into the pasture in front of us. Being bored, restless 16-year-olds, we start playing Flappy Bird. As we are sitting here waiting for daylight, we hear some leaves start to rustle. My friend whispers to me, there's moving early this morning. We shut our phones off and let our eyes adjust to the dark again. 
That's when I caught something on the edge of the creek slowly walking out. At this point, I was just waiting for the deer to walk out and start grazing on the pasture in front of us. Out of nowhere, this deer let out a small growl slash howl. We froze solid. We have heard coyote and bobcat, but this, this was different. We stared at this animal that was against the tree line. It was still, it was still dead. My friend whispers to me, that's not a deer, man. What the hell is that? I said, I'm not sure. I think it might be a big stray dog or something, but it sounds sick. As we're staring at this unknown creature in the dark, my friend drops his phone onto the base of the deer stand and this creature stands up bipedally. My friend and I absolutely freak out and my friend ripped off his headlamp and pointed it at this creature. There standing in the spot we were staring at stood this canine creature. To best describe it, it looked like a big German shepherd standing bipedally. This thing had to have been seven foot tall towering over an old fence on the property line. This thing stood there for three to four seconds before dropping back down on all fours and darting back into the woods trying to get our eyes off of it. I looked at Jason and said, let's get the F out of here. We ran back to the house as fast as we could. When we got to the house, my granddad was sitting on the couch watching TV and drinking coffee, as he always did. He said, you boys are back early. Give up already? We proceeded to tell him everything that happened, and he kind of laughed at us and said, you boys got a wild imagination. We played in those woods when I was a kid, and the scariest thing that we ever saw was a terrible normal granddad joke. Finally, calm down and tried to talk about what we had seen with each other. That's when Grandpa's phone rang. It was my dad who always checks cows first thing in the morning. I don't know what my dad said to my granddad on the phone, but Grandpa stood up with the blankest face and ran to his bedroom, grabbed his old SKS rifle he had kept out to shoot coyotes and other pests, and came back to the front, front room and told me and Jason, stay here, watch TV until I get back. Jason and I stared at each other. We stood around the kitchen table for a couple hours till my granddad came back into the house, followed by my dad. Both their faces looked like they had seen a ghost. Dad tells me that Jason and I are not allowed to hunt for the rest of the weekend. Jason would need to call his mom and get him home as soon as possible. I asked my dad and grandpa what was going on, and my grandpa said, the door to the barn is still open, and 12 calves that were there, were in there are ripped open or missing. My granddad called the local sheriff to report it. I remember standing in front of that barn with three cops there. Grandpa wouldn't let me go in and look. As if I was interest, as an interested 16-year-old, everyone seemed clueless. After the cops left, my dad and grandpa cleaned out the barn and disposed of the carcasses. The rest of Saturday went on normally. The night at supper, granddad asked me, Son, when you said you saw that animal this morning, were you pulling my leg? I said, No, grandpa, I swear on everything. He said, There with a blank face. We finished supper and I headed to bed. I fell asleep to George Lopez on the TV and woke up at around 7 in the morning to our neighbor knocking on the door. Turns out he had some cows ripped apart in the pasture last night and wanted to get rid of whatever was doing it. They called Fish and Game, and they came out and did an investigation, looked around and said, We got it handled. Pretty sure it was a bear that traveled far south. As we have no bear in our area that I know of, I remember going home from my granddad's house with all this running around, running in my head, figure out what I had seen. Everything happened so fast. A few days went by and nothing out of the ordinary. Granddad wouldn't talk to me 
hardly about any of it, so I'm not exactly sure what happened after, after it all. I know that a few times a year there are reports of animal sightings matching exactly what we had seen. It's now 2024. As a grown man, I want to know as much as I can about what I saw that day, but I am not sure where to start. All right, so in the beginning of the upload, talked a little bit about Giants, Dulce, um, the government's involvement. It's all connected. All of it is connected. The paranormal, everything that we consider strange has a connection. Um, it's It's just... Unbelievable that, you know, one group of people, the Illuminati, control all of this and have their greedy little mitts deep in all of the paranormal too. Like, they they want to keep it hit, hidden as far away from us as possible. So, with that, I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is your support, after all, that keeps the channel growing and going. And honestly, what gives folks like us a place and a chance to share our experiences and theories judgment-free, just simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.